A warning that the first part of this episode involves vulgar language and violence and includes some very disturbing audio. On the evening of July 5th, 2011, a shirtless man with long red hair and a scraggly beard was wandering around downtown Fullerton. Fullerton is a small suburban city in Orange County, California. The man's name was Kelly Thomas. He was 37, and he'd been living on the streets for a long time. He also had a mental illness. He had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. It had just gotten dark, and Kelly was in the parking lot behind a local rock and roll bar. The manager of the bar saw Kelly around a lot. She later told a police investigator that he was known as Crazy Kelly. She said he looked like Jesus. That night, the manager called the police on Kelly. She said she saw him looking into the windows of cars in the parking lot. She thought maybe he was trying to break into them. Eleven minutes later, two Fullerton police officers showed up and confronted Kelly at the bus station next door. What happened next was recorded by a nearby security camera, and later it was synced up with the officers' recording devices. The footage is grainy. It shows Kelly standing on the sidewalk, arms crossed, occasionally shifting his feet. One of the officers twirls his baton in his hand and then leans casually against the patrol car. You got anything in your backpack got your name on it? No, why did you want to see some stuff? You don't mind. We just got to figure out your name so we can get out of here and go about our business so you can go sleep. That's all. The second officer asks Kelly to sit down on the curb. Kelly takes off his backpack and sits down. The first officer picks up the backpack, and in the audio, you hear him rifling through some papers. He finds some mail addressed to a man named Ronnie. The officer asks Kelly if that's his name. Is that right? No? So we should take you for having somebody else's mail? The officer continues looking through Kelly's backpack. In the meantime, Kelly and the second officer start arguing. She has her fucking knees. It's hard to hear, but the officer says to Kelly, see my fists? Yeah, Kelly says, what about them? They're getting ready to fuck you up, the officer replies. Start punching, dude. The officer pushes Kelly's shoulder. Kelly stands up, and the officer grips his baton with both hands. The other officer appears in the camera screen and hits Kelly in the leg with his baton. The second officer also takes a swing at Kelly. Then they chase Kelly off screen. 30 seconds later, the camera shows both officers on top of Kelly, trying to pin his arms behind his back. Kelly apologizes repeatedly. Then he starts saying over and over that he can't breathe. Here, dude, I can't breathe, man. Fuck! Please, I can't breathe. Another Fullerton police car pulls up, and two more officers jump out and try to restrain Kelly. One of them knees Kelly in the head then tases him. And then he strikes Kelly in the face with the butt of his taser. Later, this officer will say that he, quote, probably just smashed his face to hell. During the struggle, Kelly calls out repeatedly for his dad. Kelly stops struggling. Paramedics arrive to take him to the hospital. And five days later, he dies. The Orange County coroner would later say that the cause of death was a lack of oxygen to Kelly's brain. It was the result of compression on his chest and traumatic injuries to his head and face. Kelly had no weapon. He had no drugs or alcohol in his system. None of the officers involved were convicted of a crime. The part of Kelly Thomas's story that got the most attention, understandably, was the police violence. What is less examined, though, is how and why Kelly was living on the streets in the first place. Kelly Thomas was one of some 7,000 unhoused people in Orange County at the time. And that's what this story is about. It is dangerous to be homeless. People living on the streets are more likely to face violence in general than people who have homes. They die on average about 20 years younger than people who have homes. They die from lack of health care, untreated addictions, vigilantes, and unsafe living conditions. A record 386 unhoused people died in Orange County in 2021. 
That's according to a priest in Fullerton who keeps track and publishes their names on a local news site. Even though Orange County's unhoused population is a lot smaller than neighboring Los Angeles County, about one-tenth the size, it is twice as deadly to live on the streets here as it is in L.A. This, in the home of the happiest place on earth, the original Real Housewives, and some of the priciest beachfront property in the world. And yet people who study homelessness, who work with people on the streets every day, agree that there is a single best solution to this problem. And it seems kind of obvious. It's housing. And in the case of someone like Kelly, something called permanent supportive housing. It's a place of one's own, like an apartment, that also comes with support services, like mental health therapy, addiction treatment, and job counseling. But at least in Orange County, it is very hard to build this kind of housing. And the biggest obstacle isn't money or a lack of land or even a lack of developers that want to build it. It's us. I don't want 80 people that need security and mental health services living this close to my neighborhood. We have enough going on with the homeless that are leaving their needles, their drugs, their messes. We are not going to stand by and watch you ruin our neighborhood more and let this come in. We will sue you if something does not happen to make this it will not happen. I'm Jill Replogle, and this is Imperfect Paradise from LAS Studios. This season is called Home is Life. It's the story of the fight to build housing for people experiencing homelessness in the very city where Kelly Thomas was killed. It's the story of where to house people living on the streets, and really, whether to do it at all. I'm a reporter at KPCC in Los Angeles, and back in 2018, I followed a man named David Galanders as he tried to get approval to build an apartment complex in Fullerton for formerly unhoused people. The story ran as a series on the radio. By the way, our newsroom uses the term unhoused instead of homeless because people consider all kinds of places their home. But you'll hear people use both terms in this story. Anyway, I was interested in following David's quest because, at the time, it seemed like everybody in Orange County was talking about homelessness. There was a big lawsuit going on over the lack of emergency shelter and housing. And I wondered, when it came down to an actual project in a real place, whether Orange County residents would support it. The first time I meet David, it's a hot summer day in 2018. We're standing in a vacant lot in Fullerton where he hopes one day to build homes for 80 of the area's chronically unhoused residents. <laughs> well, right now it's a city yard, so there's all kinds of construction materials, trucks. He has the sleeves of his dress shirt rolled up and his arms are covered in tattoos. There's one near his left elbow crease that's a set of keys with a tag that says home is life. The phrase speaks to his job working with unhoused people, but also to his own life. David grew up in North Orange County, where Fullerton is. His parents split when he was 12, and after that, his mom had a hard time paying rent. Where we would get three-day notices, where the rent was late every month, where, you know, we would be on the verge of trying to find a new place all the time, where my mom, we had to couch surf for a long time so my mom could just save the money to get us into an apartment. Like, that stuff was all very real for me. As a teen, David fell in love with punk music, especially the band Jawbreaker. He became a vegan, he protested against corporate greed, and he had his first conversations with people living on the streets, outside of punk shows in L.A. He learned that their story wasn't so different from his own. After high school, David went into the music industry, but it just wasn't fulfilling. So he ended up becoming a social worker, trying to keep people from becoming homeless. A few years and a few jobs later, he got a call. Would David be interested in a position as executive director of a nonprofit in Fullerton? Recruiter calls me one day and says, um, hi, I'm such and such recruiter, and I have a position you might be interested in. It's executive director of a nonprofit in Fullerton. It says, is it Pathways of Hope? And she goes, yep. And I go, perfect, I want it. Like, I went to my interview. And she's like, okay. Pathways of Hope was founded in Fullerton in 1975. Its mission is to provide food and shelter to low-income people in the area. 
People in Fullerton love Pathways of Hope. Many of them volunteer to sort through canned vegetables at its food bank and donate Lego sets and stuffed animals for its holiday toy drive. In David's job interview, he proposed shifting the organization's mission to focus more on long-term solutions like housing. Because even though donating toys and volunteering in soup kitchens helps people get through the day and it makes us feel good, it's kind of just putting a Band-Aid on the real problem. Yes, handing out toys to families matters. Yes, everyone's got to eat. But it's literally homelessness. It's not souplessness. You know what I mean? It's not clotheslessness. It's not showerlessness. It's homelessness. Demonstrate for me how homelessness has ended with anything other than a set of keys, a lease, and a place to call home. In other words, home is life. David didn't know Kelly Thomas, but he works with people like Kelly often. He thinks if Kelly had had a place to live with the support he needed to manage his mental health problems, Kelly's life might have had a very different outcome. I would just separate out for a second what happened that night from what Kelly Thomas needed the entire time he was homeless, right? What led up to that circumstance? What made it possible so that Kelly was still homeless and still not taking proper medication and not having the care he needed to be safe and to be healthier than than he was at the time. David got the job. And in the spring of 2018, he took his permanent supportive housing idea to city officials. And they were interested. At the time, a group of cities in Orange County was putting together a plan to build enough permanent supportive housing for every chronically unhoused person in the county. And they were asking all the cities, including Fullerton, to build their fair share. It seemed like David's proposal could be a good fit. They just needed to figure out where to build it. So some city staffers brought David to see this vacant city-owned lot where I first meet him. It's a long, skinny triangle. It's bordered on one side by four sets of railroad tracks and on the other by a busy street called Commonwealth Avenue. And across the street is this local institution called Kimmy's Coffee Cup. David thought it was a great location for permanent supportive housing. He envisions white stucco and red tiled roofs to match the city's classic Southern California style. David told me it would be a long process to get anything built on the lot. He was going to need a bunch of city approvals. He'd have to get the financing in order. He'd also have to apply for state and federal housing grants. But the first step... It was basically procedural. City officials drew up what's called an exclusive negotiating agreement between Fullerton and Pathways of Hope. It said, essentially, that the city wouldn't sell the land to anyone else while they were negotiating. David didn't expect it to be controversial, and neither did city officials, for that matter. That's after a break. The city council meeting to approve the agreement took place on June 5th, 2018. Good evening. It's my pleasure to call the City Fullerton City Council special meeting. I wasn't at the meeting, but I watched it later on the city's website. Mayor Doug Chafee starts the meeting. It's a full audience. Most of the people sitting in rows in tightly packed fold-up seats are there to speak up about David's project. Word has already spread around the Kimmy's Coffee Cup neighborhood. Tonight before you, I, uh, for your consideration, is an exclusive negotiation agreement between Pathways of Hope and the city of Fullerton for the development... Mayor Chafee invites David to the podium to pitch the idea before the public weighs in. David is wearing a sport coat and a burgundy-colored dress shirt. His hair is slicked back. He looks serious confident. Everyone in this room wants a solution to homelessness. I believe that. I believe people want to see an end to homelessness in some way because it affects them. It affects them through community health. Um, It affects all of us through tax burden. And I think this is the solution to resolve a lot of those issues. Those unhoused people you see downtown every day, he says, we're going to house 80 of them. Those folks won't be there because we will have them housed. They'll be formerly homeless at that point, not currently homeless. That's a big difference. Uh, Thank you. We may ask you back for some questions. Sure. Since you are the applicant. May we have a speaker? Please identify yourself and uh, come forward. Um, Hi, good evening, Council. My name is Stephanie Bromley, and I live in the Kimmy's Coffee Cup neighborhood, is what I like to call it. Over the next hour and 35 minutes, 14 people speak in favor of David's housing proposal. 
If I was to become homeless in a couple of months, I would want to make sure that there would be a place for me to go, and that's what Pathways is providing. This isn't a sentence of declining property values and people wandering through your neighborhood. This is not a shelter. These are homes for people. 23 people speak against it. We have enough going on with the homeless that are leaving their needles, their drugs, their messes. This is not against homeless. This is pro-families. Think about us. Think about our children. And I'm really going to fight this all the way. Even after. We are not going to stand by and watch you ruin our neighborhood more and let this come in. We will sue you if something does not happen in Victoria. It will not happen. When its council members turn to speak, a couple of them propose moving forward with the exclusive negotiating agreement and then hashing out the details with David and the neighbors later. But ultimately, they vote three to two to postpone the agreement with Pathways. Council member Greg Seaborn gives David a task. Frankly, it's dead in the water unless the neighbors are at least lukewarm supportive. And right now, there's not a lukewarm support there. Pathways has been a great partner in the community. You guys do it right. I know that if this thing goes forward, you would do a great job. But I'm convinced of that, but you need to convince everyone else of that, too. Basically, if they were going to move forward with David's plan, first, he'd have to win over the neighbors. The council gives him four months to do it. Four months to convince the neighbors that having formerly unhoused people as neighbors won't ruin their property values, won't make the neighborhood less safe, won't mean even more people living on the streets. I meet up with David afterwards to see how he's feeling. You know, Florentin has very few parcels of land that'll work. A lot of folks at the city council meeting were like, there's other places you could go, other places you can do this. The truth is, I've been over the map with the city staff. There are no other places to do this. David seems a little taken aback by the beating he took from some people who spoke at the meeting. But he also seems undaunted. You know, I'm very confident, though, with that community education piece, with that dialogue with the community, we can, we can overcome what the differences are and, and, figure, and, and help people understand what, why this is a benefit, but also help us understand what's needed to be in this community and be neighbors with them, because we will be. But a conversation he had with one of the neighbors after the meeting gave him pause. Uh, you know, introduced myself. I thought we had a good, productive, you know, 10, 15 minutes of talking. But at the end of it, someone still said immediately, I won't support whatever this is. And that's, that's troubling to me, you know. It's troubling. And so, slightly defensive, but also optimistic, David starts planning out his campaign. Will he be able to win over the neighbors? And what happens if he can't? Not just for this project, but for solving homelessness, period. That's coming up in episode two of Imperfect Paradise, Home is Life. This season of Imperfect Paradise is written and reported by me, Jill Redlogel. Emily Guerin is the senior producer, editor, and fact checker. Additional editing by Antonia Cerejido, Sofia Polisa Carr, and Suzanne Levy. Antonia Cerejido and Leo G are the executive producers for LAist Studios. Mixing and original music by E. Scott Kelly. Additional tracks commissioned by Mija Management and composed by El Mañana. Special thanks to Voice of OC for their reporting on this story. Also thanks to Donald Pass, Ethan Ward, Tony Marcano, Maura Waltz, Ross Brenneman, Hasmik Bogosian, and Megan Garvey. Our website is designed by Andy Cheatwood and the digital and marketing teams at LAist Studios. They also created our branding. Thanks to the team at LAist Studios, including Taylor Kaufman, Kristen Hayford, Kristen Muller, Andy Orozco, Michael Cosentino, and Leo G. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Imperfect Paradise is a production of LAist Studios.